Hello, everybody. Welcome. A belated happy International Women's Day to all. We are so excited to have you with us here today for episode 112 of ASBN Live. I'm Thelissi Sivalingam, the Manager of Events and Programming, and I'm thrilled to be introducing this fantastic webinar brought to us by our partner, JumpScale. I'm excited to be streaming in from Sapmi, the homeland of the Sami people. In the spirit of this webinar, I'm visiting a local Sami business tomorrow that's preserving their ancestral reindeer herding traditions, which is essential to the ecosystem here. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Alexis Bunton, PhD. Thanks so much, Sulasi. Um, hi, welcome for joining us today. We're really excited to talk to you about the future of and the now of indigenous led businesses. I'm here with two incredible leaders from Alaska, um, where I'm also originally from, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Dune Lankard, who is Eak and Athabaskan with the Native Conservancy, and Elena Peterson, who is Clinkett and with uh, Spruce Root. And they'll tell you more about what they're doing. We're gonna have a really great conversation today. But before I get a little further into introductions, um, I wanna let you know how this webinar is gonna go. I have a few questions that I've kind of pre-selected that we're going to discuss. And each of us will take a few minutes to answer each question. And then if we want to, we'll bounce off what we heard each other say. And we are gonna have Q&A at the end. We're gonna to try to stop at least 10 minutes early for the Q&A, but if we can get to 15 minutes of Q&A, that's fantastic. So we're planning on being here about an hour, but if we wanna stay longer past the hour, Elena and I will be able to stay here. So, um, so for myself, um, I am zooming in from Rumson Ohlone territory in one of the tiniest cities in California called Delray Oaks. It's nestled uh, basically in Monterey, California. And, uh, but I was born in Seattle and I grew up between Seattle, Juneau, Honolulu. And um, funnily enough, uh, it was not till I moved to Central Coast, California that I found out that there's some kind of a corny trope among people in Big Sur, they always say, I studied with a pipe cleaner in on Pine Ridge for like three months and they think they're an expert. But <laughs> I actually did live <laughs> on the Rosebud Reservation as a kid, but not in the corny way, in the way that my mom worked for the Native Hospital <laughs> when I was a kid for a little while. Um, anyway, so uh, after college, I returned back to Alaska. Okay, sweetie, I'm doing an introduction. My kid's home from school. That's our reality. Um, I worked at the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute and the Alaska Native Heritage Center. I left to go to grad school because I really wanted to change policy around deploying. You can, look at this. It hurts. Okay, sweetheart. Around deploying capital um, and resources to our Native communities that have so sorely been um, left out of this because of uh, intergenerational trauma, ongoing settler colonization, um, and stereotypes, like one of the most pervasive worst stereotypes that indigenous peoples are poor or have to be poor, are supposed to be poor. It's absolutely not true. Um, especially, I don't know much about EAC culture, but I bet it's similar to Clinket culture. Traditionally, um, it was a very, very rich culture, very rich in resources. There was a form of capitalism. The idea that indigenous peoples and capitalism don't mix is an absolute stereotype <laughs> meant, to, <laughs> meant to keep us out of the system. And we're all here break, um, breaking out of that for our communities right now. So I'm very excited to hand it over to Dune to introduce yourself and then Elena, and then we'll get into the questions. Sure. Um, my name is Dune Lankard. Uh, I met a lot of you when I was at uh, in San Diego. And, you know, I um, started the EAC Preservation Council and shortly later, after the Exxon Valdez oil spill uh, in 1989, March 24th, marks the 33rd anniversary, I started the Native Conservancy to change the way that land conservation was done and to also change the public interest valuation process. And uh, I've spent my life uh, working uh, for and with indigenous peoples and uh, growing up with uh, 
a, a house full of, of uh, Native women that always told me what to do. <clears throat> I'm, I'm thrilled to be working with these two amazing women right now. And also happy belated uh, International Women's Day to all the women out there. Sweet, thanks, June. And I just have to say, Alexis, I love that your um, kid is, is present with us because I do think that that is such an important part of being an indigenous person. Our children are always around and um, and we, you know, I grew up always being next to my mom when she was working and around my parents as they were in meetings and doing those sorts of things. And I think it was such an important part of my childhood. And um, as I have become an adult and a mother of my, myself, I struggled with that a lot. So I think it's COVID has brought that back to more of a normal place, which I love, but that was always normal for indigenous people. So I just, oh, yeah, I just want to say thanks for, for creating that. Um, you mind if I cut in? <laughs> yeah. If, well, just to respond to that, um, I got a little distracted. So I forgot to say that I've been consulting <laughs> for over 20 years now. My first consulting gig was actually with the Alaska Federation of Natives, researching and writing their mm -hmm. first website ever. So that's how old I am. <laughs> and um, and then my mother too did drag me to all the things. And when I have consulting engagements since she was very little, uh, especially in um, the Northwest, I would tell the client, I'm bringing my kid. Can some staff member watch her? <laughs> while I do the training. And the more cockier I got, the more they said yes and did what I wanted. And the better it was for her. I um, love that. And I even I've like started channeling my mom, like at the end, I'll take the snacks and like throw it in my bag to take home. I was so mortified as a kid when we do that. But like, I'm totally that person now. Yeah. So let me. Oh, yes. And then as part of that senior advisor with jump scale, which I'll talk more about later. So um, if you could introduce yourself, Elena, thank you for commenting on yeah. that. The kid just does, I'll, she'll be with us in Sitka at a conference. Oh, soon. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I'll bring my kids. Um, or I'll try to. <laughs> I'll try to drag them along. Mine will play with yours. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, my name's Elena Peterson. Um, my Klingit name is Gahitin. I am from Sitka, Alaska, which is where I'm calling in from. Also uh, traditionally called Shitka Kwan. And um, yeah, so I was born and raised here in the mountains behind me are are, are here in Sitka. So this is um, kind of a good gives you a good idea of what what kind of landscape we live in here in southeast alaska um i uh, as i mentioned i grew up here and when i graduated like most students here in alaska i left for about 10 years to go explore and get an education um and so i my undergraduate degree was in uh, business administration with a focus in Spanish. And then after that, I went to Peru for a couple of years where I served in the Peace Corps, uh, working with entrepreneurs um, on the southern coast of Peru, doing community and economic development work. So that was my first taste of like what I really feel like was was my calling. Um, I, I'm an entrepreneur myself, and I struggled a lot early on with the juxtaposition of of wanting to be an entrepreneur, but also understanding that most of our world's problems are created through commerce and and how can I want to be an entrepreneur, but also be an indigenous person that cares about people and planet and place. And so um, as an adult, a lot of my career has been focused around bringing those two things together. And so I am the executive director at Spruce Root, which is a nonprofit community development financial institution. And um, yeah, gosh, I'm just excited to be here for this conversation with both of you and uh, share what, what knowledge or ideas I, I can with, with folks on the call today. Well, thank you so much. And let me just um, gush a little bit. I have worked, as you probably know and heard, for your uh, native corporation in Juneau, Alaska, and also for your Sitka tribe of Alaska. I worked for them for two years. So I love Clinkett country, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> and just had some amazing experiences with, um, incredible, inspiring, strong female native bosses. It's just been a great way to learn. So I'm gonna get right into the first discussion question. And that is, um, so in Alaska, of course, we're experiencing the neg negative effects of climate change at a much faster rate than what we call the lower 48, the contigu contiguous United States um, for, for many, many years now from 
uh, sea level rise, making villages have to move completely, losing villages to co ecosystem disruption, um, our fisheries, things like ocean acidification. I'm currently like quite worried about um, shellfish. So I'd like to ask each of you if you could share what your organizations are doing to address these issues through a solution of economic development. And then we'll have Dune first and then Elena. Sure. And we'll switch it. Uh, and, you know, and I just want you all to know that I'm in awe of these two women, so I'm a little bit nervous uh, because it's the first time I get a chance to work with them both. But uh, I'm an uh, EAC Athabascan Indian from the Copper River Delta in Prince William Sound. And most of you know or heard of Prince William Sound when the Exxon Valdez oil spill happened in our backyard. My EAC name is Jamatsuki, which... Uh, means a little bird that screams really loud and won't shut up. So I'm gonna put my timer on it, five minutes exactly. Um, but I'm from the Eagle Clan and I'm also a tribal member of the native village of EAC and a shareholder of the EAC Corporation and Chugash Alaska Corporation. I've spent my life uh, fishing. My education has come from the Copper River Delta and Prince William Sound. And it's really all I know. Uh, once I'm on a boat, uh, my world changes. Uh, on the land, it's a different event. Um, but when the spill happened, I sat down with my family and friends and I said, this is not how it ends. This is how it begins for us. And because a lot of people were in despair and uh, a lot of people had their hands out, wanted to become spillionaires. And we wanted to figure out how we're, are we gonna save our habitat and, and stop the ones who have lost their wisdom uh, because everyone wanted to destroy all of our resources in order to survive. And I knew that we just couldn't let that happen on our watch. And I grew up in a household with my grandmother, Ataki, uh, who helped uh, write the 4,500 page EAC English dictionary with Dr. Michael Krauss. And also my mother who uh, helped our EAC people receive the final land claims uh, two and a half years after ANCSA was passed in the law in 1971. We were able to uh, uh, get our recognition because of her hard work. And my sister Pamela, who was uh, one of my best friends and also my spiritual guru, uh, she worked with me as I was trying to preserve over a million acres of habitat in uh, the Exxon spill zone. And so when I, when I think about what happened, climate change happened to us overnight because of the Exxon spill. So for the last 33 years, we've been dealing with this. And the last four, um, you know, as some of you may know, uh, the Copper River Delta salmon are some of the most sought after salmon in, in the world. Well, four years ago, only 44,000 sockeyes came home. The following year, the ocean heated up to 76 degrees for three weeks down to 20 feet below the surface, killing millions of krill and mussels and wild kelp forests and salmon and birds. Uh, it was beyond belief what was happening with ocean warming. Now we're dealing with ocean acidification, less fish and smaller in size returning. And so, as every community that was dealing with COVID and climate change, we realized that in order to, to uh, address what was happening in our region, we had to look at the ocean differently. We had to build trust and focus between us and, and figure out uh, how we were going to uh, preserve our fishing way of life and our herring that once 200,000 ton would return to Prince William Sound we had less than 4,000 returning home. That was 50% of our annual income. So we decided to get into kelp. And I, I remember Dr. Professor Hoover, uh, Elizabeth Hoover wrote this article, how can you call yourself sovereign if you can't feed yourself? And Winona LaDuke, she came to town and, and she's on our Native Conservancy Board. She was talking about building food systems. So we decided that we would focus on uh, building a food security program to feed all of our elders and our community in this time of hardship and less, and that we would start growing uh, kelp and mariculture products in, in the water in, in these farms, ocean farms, because 
kelp can sequester carbon five to 20 times more than living terrestrial forests. Bivalves can filter 40 to 60 gallons of water each per day. So therefore, uh, one oyster farm can clean out an, an entire bay itself in an afternoon. So we realized that in talking with indigenous peoples that they are interested in getting in the kelp and maricultural space for three reasons and in this order, for restoration of the ocean uh, and, and helping our alien ocean recover uh, because there's over 300 species that make a living in kelp forests. The second is they wanted to feed their people a traditional food source and uh, Dr. Uh, Garza wrote this report and showed that uh, there was a uh, uh, thousands of years of history of every tribe living along the coast that enjoyed uh, kelp and, and uh, harvesting uh, herring row on kelp for thousands of years. And it's all we really know. My first job came from uh, uh, harvesting herring row on kelp. And now one of my last jobs is in the ocean is <clears throat> uh, uh, growing kelp. And then the last that uh, the communities, the native communities are interested in building regenerative economies that are going to provide a good way of life for people uh, helping save the ocean. So, you know, we've been uh, busy getting test sites in the water, seven kelp farms. Now we're, at, uh, we're funding uh, 11 uh, indigenous farmers to get uh, kelp farms in the water this year. So we're working fast and hard doing everything we can on our end. Thank you, Dune, and take it away, Elena. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, so, you know, for a long time, and I think I appreciate the share for about ANCSA um, in the chat there. If, if people aren't aware, you know, Alaska has a different history than the rest of the, the lower 48s when it comes to indigenous land claims. And so we don't have the same type of setup. Um, as most of the of the country with reservation systems. So we don't have reservations. There is one reservation in Alaska, but um, it's very small. And, and so most of our, um, our system here is based on a corporation structure, indigenous owned corporations and the tribes as separate entities. And so I just point that out because I think it, it, it's a significant thing to understand about Alaska. If you're curious to know sort of how, how things work here for indigenous people, it's not, not the same with, as the reservation system. Um, and so I, I also lead with that because I think for, for many years, for far too long, you know, indigenous people have been left out of the decision-making rooms. And I think when they finally were brought in, it was through, um, you know, more of a traditional Western approach uh, through boardrooms, through the corporations. Um, and, and usually these decisions are happening far away. And so in my experience in, in life, you know, my sicko was a, had a big pulp mill when I was a young, um, uh, when I was a child. And, and at some point I must've been around, you know, eight or nine when it shut down. And I remember it because it was really a big deal and everyone thought horrible things were going to happen. I remember being like, oh no. And a lot of my move, my friends had to leave town and, um, and in the end, though, you know, our town has thrived and our town is amazing and always has been and always will be. And a lot of that is is to the fact that the indigenous people that live in, in our community and, and, and in all the communities here in Southeast Alaska are resilient and have been here and will continue to be here despite these boom and bust industries. And so a lot of the work we're doing in Spruce Root is to try and shift the paradigms that of power um, that have existed and that haven't worked for the people that live here for so long. And so really our, our main focus is to move the, the power to support localized economies that are really grounded in indigenous values and ways of living. And so that looks different for every community. Um, and, and that type of work, uh, it doesn't always, <clears throat> it doesn't always sound like it's economic development work, but it really truly is economic development work. Um, and, and it takes, it takes, it's a long-term vision and it takes time. And, and so, um, so most of our community and economic development work is focused on that relationship building and community building work. Um, and so we do a lot of this through what's called the Sustainable Southeast Partnership. It's a collective impact network. 
uh, that's been around for over 10 years now. And it's really been, uh, you know, there's a lot I could say about that, but it really has been a significant model for how we've been able to move communities forward, um, you know, build trust where there was a lot of broken um, relationships between entities and individuals. Um, so folks who maybe conservationists who who wouldn't work with timber industry, um, Alaska Native corporations who own timber companies, you know, there's just there were so many fractured uh, relationships and, and we've been bringing those people together and and building trust and it's really been working and so those same folks are now working in partnership with one another and building solutions and so. Um, so that's been our approach to addressing issues of climate change or issues of um, intergenerational trauma, all these things that are, are, are affecting our communities today. Um, and so what Spruce Root's been able to do is really um, bring resources to fund some of the research that's involved in that or the development of projects. Um, and we've been supporting specific industries that are important to the communities. And so. I point that out because we don't come in as a as an organization and say this is you know here's a great idea that you guys should do we really build a relationship in a community figure out you know what community priorities are and then support that work in a way that makes sense for that community so it looks different from place to place um and a lot of the i think the more innovative businesses and solutions that are coming out of communities have to do with tourism uh food security um, what some people call subsistence, but we like to consider it ways of life, um, mariculture, as Dune mentioned, and energy solutions or renewable energy solutions. Um, and then some other things that I think is making a huge difference is, is our ability to bring resources to the table. Um, and so that's a lot, feeds in a lot to the paradigm shift work that, that I mentioned, uh, um, which is, you know, a lot of communities, there's maybe two or 300 people in a community. And, you know, the head of the tribe is also the mayor, who's also a mom, who's also, you know, they have many, many hats. And, and, and so few people are doing a lot of things. So they don't have the ability to then go and chase down the dollars or the tools or whatever resources they may need to get a project going. And so they sort of stay in this loop of federal funding where they're just trying to comply with reports and keep the money that they already have. And it's not, it's, it's a system that's set up to fail. And so what we've really been focusing on is bringing in resource, using our capacity at Spruce Root to bring those resources to bear and set up a you know per, perpetual fund so that we're not having to chase these dollars in a system that just doesn't work. Um, so that we're more in control as a region and as communities uh over over how those resources are deployed how they work and, and and what we use them for and then i think the last thing that's really really important in the crux of everything we're doing is is bringing youth into all of this and so you know the next generation is is the solution and so we we have to we have to hold them up and we have to value them and bring them to the table all the time and have them a part of every single piece of what we're doing because without them we're doing this um you know who are we doing this for and then without them we're, we're kind of setting ourselves up to fail because they're not there ready to move it forward after after us so so youth work is really an important part of everything we're doing as well. And I think they, you know, they're so innovative. They see the problems, they wanna fix them. This next generation is, you know, I just have so much hope that they're going to take whatever we, what platform we create and, 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 and build the, the future that we all want and that we all see. And so, so yeah, youth are at the crux of everything that we're doing as well. Wow, I am so inspired. I kept looking for the reactions thing so I could clap in the background, but I don't have it on this on this webinar. Um, uh, I was wondering if the host could give me sharing capability. Is that possible? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can share now. I just wanted to share something. Uh, I wanna to respond to what I heard doing you and Elena, you say. And I just remembered that I, haha, 20 years ago, another very early gig I had, um, BBC came to Alaska and they wanted to shoot a reenactment of the um, 
of the um, coming to Alaska by boat theory to combat the ice bridge theory. And that was very new then. And I had all these kayakers, these like local native kayakers uh, lined up, ready to go kayak. And this was a boat we built at the Alaska Native Heritage Center where we actually relearned the traditional watertight skin sewing technique that was almost completely lost. Like we were talking to old ladies in villages to get that technique back then, but I thought you would appreciate that. That is Prince William Sound Dune <laughs> where we shot. And the boat was the first boat this guy had made. And so it was like a little bit too narrow and it was extremely very dangerous. <laughs> But I wanted to share that with you guys. I'm not going to share anything else after that. Um, and also, Elena, to respond to you, um, I really don't think you need to be telling people how awesome Sitka is, because then they will come. <laughs> I know, right? I it's a Sitka. secret. I'm trying to keep, yeah. <laughs> it's so pretty, so pretty. Um, so actually, funny story. When I was working for Sitka Tribe of Alaska, I was working for tribal tours. Shameless plug of book. <laughs> about it. <laughs> and um, they asked me if I wanted to become a member of the tribe because they had funding so I could get my commercial driver's license so I could work. And I said, no, no, I'm not going to join, but th thank you. You're very generous, but uh, I'll just go through the state workers funding program. And it was difficult, but I did it. And I, I got my commercial driver's license. Um, and I can't wait to be, you mentioned subsistence. I can't, I'm hoping that when I get there, there's the herring are there. Cause I want to eat some yeah. herring eggs. It's My daughter wants to harvest herring eggs. She saw the episode of Molly of Denali about it. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, told I mean, her it's, it. it's going to happen any, any day now. It's, it's so, such a thriving time here. I love this time of year. It's, it's I amazing. can't wait. And that's the thread that really holds all of us together. Sorry about that. That, it's the fishing. It's living on the ocean. It's that saying that they have across so many Alaska Native tribes, when the tide is out, the table is set. And I too come from a subsistence and commercial fishing family in Bristol Bay. And um, also I'm a shareholder of Bristol Bay Native Corporation in Pogvik Village. And one of the things about that fishing way of life and that Alaska way of life is you can't just go to the store and buy a gallon of milk or get some cereal. The cereal is like $10 for one thing. Um, if you're if your truck breaks down, you can't just get to a mechanic in most places in Alaska. You have to be very resilient and resourceful and able to figure things out on the fly. And this is why I think that indigenous entrepreneurs are just so have solutions that people aren't used to thinking of because they're not they're not trained their whole life to come up with duct tape workarounds to everything, you know, and like innovative ways to fix things. We really, by this way of life, learn to think outside the box and be innovative. So um, I also wanted to respond to what you said about the youth. I remember I had a consulting client in Alaska. It was a tribe. And um, one of the issues we have up there is our talent pool. They go to school, then they leave the state, don't come back. <laughs> Excuse me. And, um, and, uh, and I had the, and so what happens is the people who are end up being the bosses, even in the native owned businesses are often non-native and they don't understand our values and ways of doing things. And they try to make us bend to the way they do things when we have a way better idea of what works in place. So with this one client, this was a problem they had. All the workers were tribal members and all the bosses were imported from the lower 48. And I just said, they said, okay, when I gave them the solutions, I said, what you need to be doing is getting in the high schools now. You need to work with these students at the high school level because they are our future bosses that are gonna steward the land and the resources and fight climate change and all of these things. So I'll just take another couple of minutes here. Um, as I was doing some research, kind of like the state of native business uh, with my jump scale hat on, I came upon a fascinating statistic. I had to crunch the numbers and I figured it out myself. Nationwide, native 25% native, of Native Americans are business owners, compared to 10% among Americans as a whole. That's a huge entrepreneurship rate. And I think that may have to do with some of that underlying as I was saying about being resilient, um, being greedy, figuring things out yourself. You find a you see a problem, you find a solution. Um, and so what we're doing at Jump Scale, and I think this is the first time we're going to announce this in public. So if you're here, you're the first to know. Um, we are launching a um, 
a program called Resilient Circles. And we are not launching it in Alaska with Alaska Native owned businesses. Um, we're specifically looking for business leaders that are solving local problems, but, in, but are regenerative. And these regenerative businesses that we can support to be healthy and to scale, however they define scale. Scale is defined differently cross-culturally. And then to come in on the back end and support these businesses um, in getting extra funding through our networks and things like that. And we really believe, uh, we, I know, we know that there are a lot of innovative things happening in Alaska that folks everywhere else need to learn about, like who the organizations and entrepreneurs that Spruce Root is incubating, like what Dune is doing with Native Conservancy and vertical kelp farming. So the thing about these resilient circles that I'm excited about and that really sets them apart is that we are going at it with a well-being focus. And our theory is that if we can support healthy organizations that are rooted in culture and values, that each each worker in that healthy organization, they're going to bring it home. And then that's going to affect ripple out to their family. And then that's going to ripple out to the community. And really the idea is using entrepreneurship as a way to, as a way to address intergenerational trauma, ongoing colonial capitalism, and, um, and the negative ripple effects for, and to heal really to heal from it. So, well, uh, there are quite a few experts in well-being at jump scale. And the idea is really to help provide a framework and the supports that these businesses need, but that the solutions, the practitioners all need to be rooted in their own communities. It has to be elders that know the way things are done. We can't bring someone in from the outside to infuse well-being. We're just there to support the framework. So I'm really excited to announce that here. And um, if you were with me at ASBN, I also announced that um, I have a business I've started up that I'm fundraising for called Waka, which means hi in Yupik. And it's a, it's a tourism indigenous tourism platform. So I'll stay on the call if anyone wants to talk with me more about that. If somebody could put in, um, if somebody could put in the nativeland.ca website, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, that's the website where you go and you can find out who's in traditional territories you live on. Um, the person who developed that, who is also um, the CEO of a, of a tech company called Mapster, He's my tech guy. He's building my app. He's amazing. And let me tell you, this is going to be so big because nativeland.ca, that's just to find out whose land you are, not to even find people and experiences. And they get up to 10,000 hits, a, between like four and 10,000 hits a day. And on days like Columbia, Columbus Day, they get like 1.5 million hits on that day alone. So I know people are going to come to this platform. So stay after the webinar. I'll stay longer to talk about it. But um, so that gets me to... The next question. Um, so I talked about how we get crafty with solutions, which is why we're great entrepreneurs. But I also think that I mentioned at the top of this webinar that there's a lot of negative stereotypes about us, you know, that we're poor, that we're not smart, that we can't do things, that we, uh, that we think negatively. We do have the highest suicide rates. A lot of that, of course, is related to colonial capitalism. But I like to think about building business networks in terms of an asset-based approach. And I studied a lot of um, cognition and linguistics as a grad student. And one of the things that there's really exciting research on is the bilingual brain. Uh, there's been really interesting research showing that bilingual brains are more adept at coming up with novel solutions. And now this research hasn't been done, but I've seen it. And I feel like when you live bicultural, that's the that's an asset. That's a bicultural advantage. If you have to, what they say, walk into worlds, be native, but also be able to succeed in the mainstream, you're code switching your thoughts. You're code switching your values. You're, you're crossing them over with each other sometimes. And I believe that that's a huge advantage for our native entrepreneurs to, um, to really be able to come up again with novel solutions to things and out of the box solutions to things and all these exciting things that Dune and Elena are doing. So that is what going to cue us up for the next question, which is, uh, and then we'll have Elena go first, then Dune. What are some of the ways that these businesses are rooted in and operate from values that non-natives can learn from and apply to their business practices? 
Yeah, um, that's so interesting you say that. My kids are are bilingual. My my husband's um, Peruvian, and so he speaks Spanish and and then English as well. And then they also attend culture classes, and they're learning Klingit, which is very exciting because I didn't have that opportunity uh, when I was growing up. And so they they're kind. Of, I I think you're right. You know, they I can see how they switch. Um, their ability to express themselves in different languages and just their ability to understand the world in a different way through different languages. Uh, so it's pretty cool. But um, I think the, you know, the first, I mentioned this earlier, but my personal experience, you know, entering into entrepreneurship as an indigenous person was, was a bit rot. I was not, I didn't feel confident that, that it was okay. I felt like it was something bad that how could I be an indigenous person that wants to run a business and just loves everything about business and commerce? But you made this point already. You know, we indigenous people, especially I all I know Klingit people, we have been entrepreneurs. We always have been entrepreneurial. Our um, our culture is such a thriving culture. We were we we always have been so abundant that and and we know this because um, our our ability to preserve and harvest food with the innovative techniques that we that we built over um, over millennia is is is, you can only do that when you're thriving right when you have food water shelter when your basic needs are met and so our people always were thriving because they had they were able to build innovative techniques for um, for for different ways of life and then also our arts is so highly technical um if you can learn anything about northwest coast arts or form line design it's pretty fascinating um it's all math and geometry and and it's it's really amazing to see and 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 learn about that because it, it just goes to show how advanced our our people have always been and and so they're they're entrepreneurial they're innovators and, and innovation is defined as bringing together two things that already exist in a way that hasn't been done before and I think I love that. I love thinking about innovation in that way because that is exactly what we do. And so a lot of the entrepreneurs that we work with are doing that. They're, you know, seeing, I mean, typical um, entrepreneurial thing. They're seeing a problem and creating a solution, or they're they're looking at something um, and and applying more modern technology to it in a way that hasn't been done before. And so. Um, we're seeing this in many different industries and um, some of the, the things that I get really excited to see, especially just in the past two years um, with social media and indigenous people's ability to um, utilize it to build a business that, you know, they might, I, I, you know, just two years ago, a lot of these small cottage industry makers were showing up at all of the bazaars and the holiday events and selling their goods at tables. And due to the pandemic, they all have really shifted and grown their businesses by being able to sell direct to people through um, through Instagram or other online platforms. And it's it's been amazing to see. And I think one of the things I keep asking myself is like, where did all the employees go? We're having such a workforce development issue across the country. It's exacerbated here in Alaska because Alaska, we already have so few people anyways. Um, where did they all go? And I think a lot of the people that I... Um, that, that I know, you know, they they just didn't go back to work because they found this other revenue stream uh, through through the internet or through social media, and so um, so that's one example that I I think we're all seeing. But I really love seeing Indigenous people taking that and and creating new things. So one of one of the gals that I I I know she um, she does weaving and but she's been utilizing platforms to teach more, and so you can actually buy like a kit from her and then pay her directly to teach you through you know zoom or online to teach you how to weave and um and so you buy the kit it gets shipped to you you join the class you learn how to do it and then you can continue to pay her for her knowledge and oh i just love that it's so amazing and i, I know more of that's gonna be growing here um but i think those are those are great ways to, for indigenous people to you know be building um more self self-sustaining revenue while they can live the life that they want to be living. And so that innovation of learning how to utilize the internet um, is pretty awesome. And then I think I think another important trend or thing that we're seeing is, is a lot of value add production. And so we sort of think about, you know, you could look at ocean products and forest products. Um, 
a lot of times there's overlap, but we 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 think about them as as sort of two separate buckets. And so the a lot of entrepreneurs are 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 doing what we call value add production, right? So they're finding a product, adding value to it in some way, and then um, selling it on the market. And that's the kind of thing that I just I think makes so much more sense than the um, high, like low value, high waste sort of production of say the timber industry or other fishing industries. Um, and so this is a trend that's happening across both ocean and forest products, but that that's a really important one for sustainability. And, um, and it takes, it does take a lot of innovation though, to figure out how do I take a product like kelp, um, add value to it, and then produce it in a way that is good for my community, good for the environment, um, but also generates profit. And, and so that triple bottom line approach, you know, it's just natural to indigenous people, but it, it definitely takes um, extra effort. You can't just ap approach it and simply, it has to be, you have to really take a lot of time to think through, figure out what works, trial and error. Um, and, and so we're seeing a lot of that happening, which is really exciting. And then I think the, the other, um, similar to Valya, but is plants as food and medicine. You know, we have so much knowledge about the resources that are, are native to the place that we're from. And so, um, you know, there's, there's some difficult, this is a tough one because, uh, you know, we don't want to take the resource um, in a way that isn't respectful. We don't want to take the resource in a way that depletes it. Um, we want to make sure we're doing these things in the right way. And, and so there is a lot of tension right now um, with indigenous, indigenous knowledge um, bearers that know what plants and medicines can be used for what and how to um, take them and, and adapt them or, or create value by you know, turning them into different products and then, and then commercializing those products. And, um, you know, medicine and plants are just so important to us and we can't lose that. And so I think we're taking a slow approach and we're trying to create spaces for this dialogue to happen and learning from our elders on how to um, extract a resource in the right way. And, and, and there's so much more that goes into it than just the, the activity of doing it. You know, there's a spiritual connection. There's, um, there's knowledge that has to be shared and passed down There's storytelling. And so all these things go into it. And I think that that is exciting to me. I think there's a lot of potential there, but we have to do it the right way. And so we're taking our time and trying to create the space for that. Um, I guess I'll stop there, but yeah. Yeah, so I'll just go ahead and jump in. Uh, you know, I, I feel like, um, you know, when I, when I look back at our history of the EAC people and, and you know, we originally uh, came out of the interior of Alaska and came down to the coast in Yakutat and, and headed uh, uh, west across the, uh, the Gulf of Alaska to 300 miles to what's now known as Cordova and Prince William Sound. But the EACs, uh, I imagine when I go back that, you know, they built these uh, ice sled boats and just went down the glaciers right to the ocean. And as the glaciers were receding, a thin green strip of habitat was being formed that allowed the EACs to live along the coast. And we never numbered over a thousand in the history of time because the habitat didn't allow for it. And the EACs uh, originally had started uh, taken hooligan, which is like a smelt or a um, little torpedo of energy, and they would cold press the oil out of the hooligan to uh, be able to create fire and light and uh, cooking and uh, heat. And so we were, you know, some of the um, uh, barters and traders that, you know, different people wanted to trade with because we had this oil that we had rendered from the hooligan. And, you know, and so when I think about um, entrepreneurs, like, you know, I've won several awards for my work over the years, saving habitat and being entrepreneurial. And, and the model has always been scale up, scale up, scale up. Well, we're scaling up by scaling down the model. Uh, 
what we want to do is we want to figure out how to take um, old coal storages in, that have been built in a lot of our villages by the seafood industry and repurpose those buildings to actually do value added processing. And eventually we're going to build biorefineries in our villages and areas uh, of and regions. So we can do a lot of the work ourselves this time. We don't want to be owned by industry anymore. As a fisherman, we've been owned for 150 years by the seafood industry. And I really believe that at this point, because what's happening through kelp and mariculture farms is a modern day land claims that we're witnessing that's happening on native lands in front of our villages. And so uh, we need to figure out how to, uh, you know, become divers. We have a, a, a diver program where we're certified, certifying native divers to go down and collect their own seed. Uh, we're training the trainers so native peoples can build their own kelp and mariculture farms. Uh, we want to do our own harvesting, our own processing, our own value adding, our own marketing, uh, and figure out you know, how to uh, redo these facilities to incorporate renewables like solar, wind, tidal, biodiesel, uh, run of the river hydro. So we can reduce those overall energy costs. But at this point in history, we're all outliers. We have this opportunity uh, to build resiliency. And a dear friend of mine, Michael uh, Bazanson said, Dune, if it's not regenerative, just don't do it. And I took that literally. I was like, okay, I get it. You know, we need to figure out how to build resiliency for our communities because my whole life I've believed in sovereignty, subsistence, and spirituality. If what I'm doing doesn't have those three things, then I'm probably not interested. I'm going to be out playing basketball or ping pong or pool. But for me, you know, it's about the customary and traditional use of kelp in the mariculture species. It's about, you know, how do we create entities that are actually going to uh, serve not only the native people, but serve the ocean in this time of great need? Because for most of my life in the last 33 years, I've shared the power of place with people. And that's what gotten their attention. And they come and they visit, they go rafting down the Copper River with us or go out in the sound and go on these, these excursions. But what we're witnessing right now more than anything is the power of need. And so these communities have that need and we have solutions that are actually going to help, you know, uh, our communities, you know, uh, take care of themselves, figure out how to do things like, for example, we wanna build a native kelp cooperative. So we're creating healthy coopetition to figure out how we can get more kelp in the water, how we can reduce our overhead expenses everywhere from permitting, uh, to getting gear, to getting boats, to getting loans. We're working with Elena uh, to create an Indigenous Ocean Farmers Grant and Loan Program that allows uh, Indigenous farmers to be able to get low interest, long-term deferred loan payments so they can actually get into this industry and buy a boat. Because unlike fishing that starts in May and ends in October, we start kelping in October and end in May. So we're out on the water in the coldest, darkest, stormiest times of the year. So you have to have you know, good uh, equipment and that's why we bought a boat company. And so what, you know, the other thing is, is um, because we want to do this for ourselves in our way that makes the most sense for our communities, that uh, as uh, you know, some of these communities are witnessing upwards of 75, 80, 85 percent unemployment is let's start a Native Kelp Alliance, which is a 501c4 to change policy and the law, you know, where we are getting programmatic permitting in place. So instead of getting one permit that takes 18 months to two years, we're getting 10 permits at a time because the Native people want to get into this for restorative purposes. So we should be able to do this in the name of science and restoration. Uh, getting programmatic permitting in place. We want to figure out how to leave the kelp in the water longer, to actually do carbon sinks, to sequester the most amount of carbon that we possibly can. You know, we get calls from carbon traders all the time. Well, we're not interested in carbon trading. We're interested in carbon insets. We're actually getting paid to do 
carbon sequestration. So uh, the need is for magic buoys, for data buoys, smart buoys. So we bought our own buoy company. We're going to start making these magic buoys in these villages, in these communities, so we can control that data. And they're because these new farms, these ocean farms are going to be the new water keepers for the planet. They're going to help us deal with ocean acidification, ocean uh, warming and ocean rise. Uh, we're also looking at how can we do direct seeding so we can escape the buoys, lines and anchors. You know, so how we can protect our mother sea, how we can grow climate change resilient species. We want to build our own laboratories. And last but not least, we certainly want to look at getting uh, CDQs for mariculture for the surface of the ocean. We already have community development quotas for the bottom of the ocean, for the bottom fisheries north of the Aleutian chain, but we want CDQs for the surface, for the uh, uh, mariculture farms, because then the indigenous communities can own those permits, not individuals. Because what I feel is, is one day, uh, because of the rush and the push that's happening, not only in Alaska, but America, and around the world is that this could go to limited entry. We've already gone through limited entry in 74 where the natives lost all their fin fish, lost all their salmon, while the natives in Washington state ended up getting 50% of the fishery resources through the Bolt decision in the same year, treated differently, uh, two different ways. Well, they ended up with 50% of nothing after they dammed all the rivers. And you know, and so we're not, gonna, we're not in the mood for this this time. So we need to do it right. And, you know, and so when uh, Elena was talking about, you know, the youth and, you know, what we're doing to help get the youth uh, to, to rise, well, my exit strategy is the youth rising. And so I feel like if I can help put them in a position, put them in a place that is actually going to uh, help them not only understand the industry, learn about the industry, uh, but engage in a traditional harvest of a, of a resource that has kept us alive and strong for thousands of years. We're not talking about, you know, joining an emergency new mariculture industry. We've already been in one for thousands of years. The only difference is, is now it's a commercial one. And so what we're trying to do is tilt the level, the playing field so it's more level and there's more equity for indigenous peoples that want to continue to live on our land, that want to live in our villages and help our people help themselves. And we're not looking for a handout, we're looking for support. And, and you know, when I, I just hear the stories of these amazing women and, and I just have to tell you that uh, I'm so proud and, and, you know, so moved by just being in this circle to even share these stories with you all. Uh, you know, let's just keep going forward and because, and I keep telling my, my team upwards and onwards, but seaward. Thank you so much, Dune. Well, I want to, I know you've got to leave at the top of the hour. So I do have a question for you, but before that, I would love that it's perfectly for you, this question in the question box before you leave, but I do want to respond to both of you. Uh, first of all, when you mentioned hooligan, my mouth started watering and it hasn't stopped since then. Um, I think in, along the BC coast is what they call lamp fish or oil fish or something, but we call it hooligan or ooligan, which is a bastardization of ooligan. <laughs> anyway, um, and I also want to respond to what I heard you say, Elena. Um, it is hard to feel confident being a business owner um, as a native person, because traditionally we're taught First of all, we're taught to keep our damn mouth shut till we're old enough to speak. <laughs> Second of all, you're taught, you're not even supposed to introduce yourself. Um, other people are supposed to introduce you until you're old enough to introduce yourself. And what we have to learn in this aggressive uh, capitalist culture is to shamelessly plug our books <laughs> and our businesses and do all the things that go against the values that we were raised with for being in community and living in community together. So I'm going to leave you all with in the next minute with a couple of ideas here and then a call to action. Um, I do a lot of webinars with elders and I brought this up at the Sea Alaska meeting you were on. And I, um, if you do collaborate with native peoples, especially elders, um, my policy is that they are experts. They have more than a PhD doctorate in what they know and it's special knowledge. So I like to pay them $500 an hour. So if any of you in the audience do that, 
$500 an hour. That's the gold standard. Um, and then in businesses I work on and work with, um, I always think of native, native values leading businesses in, in terms of the three R's. So rootedness, where are you? What's your place? Where are you rooted? What are the lessons of the place? Reciprocity, how am I giving back? How is the organization giving back? And relationship. You can only move as fast as the speed of relationship. And that is quite in contradiction to things like what a lot of VCs like to fund because they want to get that hockey stick quick, get their money and get out. No, we work at the speed of relationship. Um, and, and also, um, I think about also thinking about the holism. Where is the business in a larger ecosystem? How does it relate to where my family is, where my community is? Again, healing from intergenerational trauma. So I want to share a little anecdote here. Um, you, I know Elena, you know Camille Ferguson. She was my boss in tourism. And we, sometimes we'd show up late because we had to be there at docks at 6 a.m. And she sat us down once and gave us a lecture and she said, do you think our ancestors showed up late when the fish showed up? Do you think people, we could show up late when it was time to go berry picking? No, you'd die. <laughs> Your whole family would die over the winter. And that is our value. You know, when we do have a fishing way of life, nobody works, nobody works harder than an Alaska native who grows up with subsistence values. When those fish come, you get out there and you stay out there until it's done. Even if you have to stay up three days and three nights, we actually had to stay up a few days to do that skin sewing technique too. Cause once you start to prepare the Ugruk skin, you have to stay up with it and work with it nonstop. And we learned that from elders who were like 80 years old at the time. And they were like, you stay up and you get the work done. So we are hard workers, but not in the same way that, um, you know, the Calvinist work ethic or whatever that stuff is tells people to work. We do it in our own way. So um, I want to do a call to action. Everybody's always fundraising. Please, I put in everybody's websites. Feel free to contact Elena at Spruce Root, Dune at the Native Conservancy. They have different kinds of um, needs. If you want to support the great work that they're doing, please contact them. Likewise, with Jump Scale, the resilient circles that I announced today, we have raised a good chunk of money and we need some matching funds now so we can run several after we finish this pilot so we can run a several concurrently your impact over the next two years. So you can contact me about that. And um, and then as far as Waka, the indigenous tourism platform goes, um, I am looking for some seed funding actively and I would really love a grant to prototype this summer um, in Alaska and around the world. So you can contact me for that. So the question for Dune before you have to turn into a pumpkin is um, how does indigenous cooperative business look like in today's business climate. And also both of you do feel free to put a specific call to action in your response too, because I know you got to go. Yeah, you know, I, I feel that uh, an indigenous cooperative <clears throat> could, you know, be, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, figuring out how we're going to, uh, you know, lessen the burden of getting into this industry. Uh, like, if I wanted to start a new fishery uh, somewhere, I could buy a boat, buy a net, get a permit, uh, and think like that particular fish, and then go chase it around. Uh, in the kelp and mariculture industry, there's like a dozen barriers to entry that we have to overcome. And one of the biggest is like what we're doing with Elena is trying to figure out this uh, indigenous ocean farmer loan program. Uh, but uh, you know, th there's everything from, you know, doing your landscape analysis to figuring out how you're going to source your seed, uh, how you're going to get a boat to get out there, uh, how are you going to build your carp kelp uh, farms, your arrays, uh, how are you going to uh, be able to deploy your seed, uh, monitor it, harvest it in the spring, uh, how are you going to be able to process it, how are you going to value add it, how, how are you going to turn it into a finished byproduct, and then how are you going to market and sell it and then get transport it to market? I mean, you know, we don't have to do that as fishermen, but as kelp and mariculture farmers, we do. So the indigenous uh, cooperative model will focus on all of those things. And at the same time, you know, I want you all to know that, um, you know, we can't believe everything that we think, you know, and, and we also um, need to, to understand that the world has changed. Uh, you know, 
it is falling apart. I mean, this war in Ukraine is killing me every single day. It, it's like, what are we doing? You know, we're, we're at a time in, on the planet that uh, climate change is impacting all of us. COVID has impacted all of us. You know, I've, I've never felt mortal in my life till now. And, and here I am at this point in my life where I'm on my downhill slide and I'm doing this amazing work, but I know that it's not enough and we gotta figure out how we can work together, how we can direct that energy, that time, money and love in whatever direction that needs it most to make a difference while it still matters. And you know, when our, our um, ocean farms are one of a thousand earth solutions that needs to be funded right now. And so when I think about, you know, um, being able to work with these two amazing women, I also think about my daughter, Ananda, who's 11. She, I'm going up to see her uh, race uh, dog sleds here uh, tomorrow. And she's concerned about the snow. Is there going to be enough snow for her to be able to race this year? And, and they've got at least two races planned. You know, I'll be able to go to a couple of them. But Ananda, she's filed two lawsuits over climate change, one when she was one and the other one she was seven. And so she's already doing her part, but we need to do our part. But if you wanna learn more about our work, go to our website, learn about our work, uh, understand you know, just what you can do to help. Uh, connect directly with me, You know, email me at doinglankard at gmail.com and we'd be happy to share uh, our work and our power of place. What, Indigenous peoples need more than anything right now is multi-year granting commitments. You know, we're, we're fighting every single day to, to, you know, figure out how we can raise our money to build a bigger team and do more work. And now that more tribes are coming on board uh, that want to get kelp in the water, we're going to need more funding. So the only way that that can really happen is through multi-year commitments. And then, you know, last but not least, I'd like to share that you know these two women are are two of my sheroes they're they're people that you know are, are standing up and doing amazing things they're changing the world as we know it right now and they're providing hope and inspiration and an opportunity at a time in history that we all need direction we need leadership like you're seeing right now today and and they're bringing the wisdom of their elders to the forefront and so Besides helping our Native Conservancy do our work and help save the ocean and feed our people and build regenerative economies that we can proud that we can be proud of, support these amazing women and we can go to the top and on our terms. So I gotta jump, but hey, I look forward to talking to you all and, and working with you two more. So big love. Talk soon. Thanks so much. Yes, Thanks, yes, yes. Dan. Well, um, what came to mind for me? What was I going to say? Shoot, trying to remember. I'll remember. Do you want to answer that question too, Elena? Because I know you're working with Dune on that. Um, also, I guess I, I would know what I wanted to say is I have a legal team over at uh, Bioneers. I also co-direct the Indigeneity program there. And we are researching this issue around CDQs and subsistence and permitting and all that stuff to support what what you and him are doing together. So um, if you want to see more of Dune too, he is going to be on a panel at the Bioneers Conference, which is happening live and in person May 13, 14, 15 at the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco. I know we have a lot of people on this call that are uh, San Francisco based, but um, yeah, um, if you want to answer that question or a call to action or respond to one of the other questions, Elena, we have two more th in the Q&A box. Yeah, well, like Dean said, I think um, he, you know, he's, uh, he, what they're doing at, at the Native Conservancy is an example of, of Native uh, cooperative, basically, but they're setting it up kind of in a different way. So they're coming at it from the nonprofit, right? A nonprofit's helping getting it going, and the they're trying to create solutions that would be applicable to the for-profit or the private sector. And so if an Indigenous, you know, they're very clear about their goal. They want more Indigenous people um in the mariculture industry and they don't want indigenous communities to be left behind as we have historically seen for the past couple hundred years we just keep you know they keep getting sort of run over by industry and um and so you know that's not going to happen with this and and dune's making sure of it and so they 
I, I think if 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 you want to learn more about what they're doing, that would be I think it's a good example of what indigenous cooperative you know approach looks like. But uh, you know, cooperatives in general are just a great approach. Um, you know, he touched on some of the things they're doing, but buying a boat company, um, uh, you know, they're they're putting these they they they're manufacturing creating this specific buoy that no one else has um, to to measure. I don't know if it's salinity, but certain nu nutrients in the water. Um, and these are things that indigenous farmers will and do need in order to be able to operate in in this industry. And so they're setting they're creating the path and the runway. Um, and and we can look at the rest of the industry that's growing there, you know, the industry isn't approaching it from that, from that same way. And so it's pretty, it's pretty fascinating to watch, um, and, and try to support. And so, yeah, as he mentioned, we are, we're working to fundraise for an indigenous farmers fund that Spruce Root would deploy and, um, uh, and, and manage and, and all of it is based on Dune's work and the work of the native conservancy. So pretty fascinating. I definitely encourage you to learn more about all that. Um, I think my, what, well, my call to actions are if you, you know, if you're interested in this kind of work and you want to support it, we are, as I mentioned, fundraising for, um, the Seacoast Trust, which is a funding, uh, for, for our ability to fund this work into perpetuity. And so I could get into a spiel about why um, philanthropy just is also another example of how we're being left behind. Um, and so we're not gonna we're, we're not gonna follow that system anymore. So we're creating our own fund that is for Southeast Alaska, that's for Indigenous communities um, and people and projects here. And uh, and so uh, I'll pop the link in the chat for that. But if you want to learn more about Seacoast Trust. That's there. I also popped a link in the chat about um, it's a it's a uh, it's a PDF. It's a read. It's called Balance at the Speed of Trust, um, but it gives some really good context about sort of how we got to where we are today and and the work that we've been doing. It's a couple of years old, so there's a lot that's happened since that was written. That's that's not in there, but um, it's a great read. And then I think if you're interested in investing, you know, directly into Indigenous or Native businesses. Uh, as I mentioned, Spruce Root has a CDFI, so connect with me if you're interested in that, and we can talk about how you can invest in the CDFI or in businesses that are CDFI supporting. Um, and then I think the last call to action is just to really support and did the Indigenous community or the people around you. And I think this can be really tough, and you said it really well as a Indigenous person that's white passing, you know, I walk into worlds and I always have and, um, and I think I can appreciate the fear around uh non-native people working with indigenous people there's a fear that you're going to mess up or do it wrong but you know we all are humans at the end of the day and we all bring value in in to this place and so i think if you can walk together with the indigenous people that are nearby you that's the best thing you could do so um, you know, you don't need to support us up in Alaska, support those that are nearby you and, and you just do that by walking with them. So finding a way to bring the value that you have to bear into the work that they're doing. And, you know, don't, don't worry about doing it right or wrong, just, just learn from them and, and, and try to support them by walking with them and not approaching it from this perspective of like, um, helping, but really just knowing that your success is bound up in their success and it's a long-term game and indigenous people are in it for the long term we always have been so we don't see things in short term we see things in long term and so just if you want to get involved in that more i'd encourage you to reach out and figure out a way to work with indigenous people nearby where you live thank you so much elena you are such a badass i'm in <laughs> such awe of everything you're saying it's wonderful and actually it reminded me of the conversation we were having yesterday around funding and supporting and investing in indigenous businesses you had mentioned you know indigenous entrepreneurs are uh, misperceived as high risk when actually we are the lowest risk, yeah. we pay back our loans the most. I already told you how we work the hardest and how we have the best ideas. So yeah. that is just total stereotype. Now I can stay on about 10 more minutes. If you can, we've got two questions yeah. and I'd love to get our answers because this recording will go up and whoever asked them can get the answers to their questions and they're great yeah. questions. Um, I'm going to take the first question here, which is 
from Chad. Um, what collaboration or inspiration have any of our speakers drawn from indigenous cultures on other continents, e.g. Africa or Australia? And now I'm going to make another shameless plug <laughs> for another book. It's a bit of an academic book. Uh, let's see if I can find the chat here. Um, I actually ha did um, postdoctoral work, uh, working very closely learning from Maori tourism and businesses and enterprises in Aotearoa. And, um, and I know you were, you were in Peru. And, um, and I learned so many different ways to break open the tourism mold and the way tourism is done by doing that work, uh, working alongside those businesses. But then I've also done consulting with other indigenous tourism businesses and put together this kind of academic book about how indigenous tourism really shapes social movements, not just the business side of it. And that book has um, stories from, uh, analyses of different tourism operations from really far away comes in how to do something new. We're more likely to listen. I see you nodding. It's so true. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so I'll leave it at that for that question. Do you, do you want to answer that question or go to the last question? I mean, yeah, you know, I, 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 um, I've had moments in, in, uh, in my work where I've been able to work with folks from um, Ateora or, or, or Native Hawaiians and uh, just learning more about the um, Pacific you know, trade routes and how, uh, how our cultures are so inspired by one another. And there's clearly so much history we just don't know. Um, and and so there's there's a lot of inspiration there that's been whenever I get the opportunity to work with folks, um, uh, indigenous people up and down this Pacific trader, I jump at it because I always just learn something new and, and amazing that I didn't know. Um, and then I'll say, yeah, my time in Peru, you know, I I um, it was really important for me to to go out into the world and and see, you know, what was beyond these mountains. Cause I just, I grew up here and I didn't get to get off this island a whole lot. And I knew there was so much more, but I couldn't really appreciate it until I experienced it myself. And so I think anyone that can spend time in an indigenous community or with indigenous communities, wherever you go, it's so valuable and you can, um, you just don't know what you're going to get from that, but it, it's, it's, truly like the most it's the most I've ever felt connected to source or God or, or the most spiritual I've been is when I'm with indigenous people um and it's because they are so connected to everything because that's that is how we are and so um uh, Peru was an amazing place to do that because there are a, there are just so many communities that are still really living traditional ways of life and and so some of these what we call third world countries that have, you know, there's parts of them that haven't been touched as much by Western um, colonialism. And so they're, they're kind of, you know, in these pockets. And um, I, on one hand, I think we have to be careful because we want to preserve them and maintain them and not uh, turn them into these spectacles. But on the other hand, something like Peace Corps or an experience that does allow you to enter into that space in a, in a respectful, I think it's so, Amazing. So yeah, I, um, I gained a lot from that experience and, and everything I do today is based on what I learned in my two years in Peru, which is so amazing because, um, you know, you, you just, you can't have everything and you can't expect to get everything from where you are. I think you need to go out and, and look for, for the tools and the knowledge that's out there for you. Girl, you just teed me up to talk about Waka again. <laughs> everywhere, everywhere I go and I travel, I always want to meet the locals, yeah. whoever, especially whoever's indigenous. And I'm all oh, for 20, over 20 years, I Google and Google and Google, and I can never find them, yeah. which is why I'm making this yeah. solution to this unique problem um, that people are hungry for, I think. Yeah. So let me go to the last question now. I don't know how my kid can be by herself this long. She's doing great. Television. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible parenting. The last question is from Julia. How can corporations help indigenous resilience and regenerative businesses? Parentheses. Understanding that corporations have plenty of conflicting interests while employing people with good intentions, or should they stay out of the way? Can I answer first? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so we've mentioned that we have 
Alaska Native corporations that came out of the ANCSA, Alaska Native Settlement Act in 1971. Our shareholders are our tribal members. We all have stock in our corporations. So for us, shareholder accountability is being accountable to your tribe and your community. That's quite different than the mainstream uh, society's concept of shareholder accountability. Um, it, can, it can be, it cannot be. And mm -hmm. I actually think that corporations and um, native-led businesses and enterprises, I think they can be good bedfellows and I think that they should aim for it and that we should work together and collaborate at the end of the day. Our native corporations aren't perfect either. Um, we have conflicts within them, but if you look to them, there's more and more, um, there's more and more examples of our corporate accountability to our shareholders that really are about upholding our traditional values. You can look up the website of my native corporation, bbnc.net. Um, also, uh, Josh, somebody there, you could put it, if you could put in a link to my uh, article, a call to attention to indigenous capitalisms, that article explains more about this. But I think really the question is, what can corporations learn from indigenous business leaders? Um, do you want to have nature have a seat at the board, for example? Um, what are your underlying values? Are you, have, are you implementing a quadruple bottom line that goes a step beyond B Corps to incorporate that spirituality or what some people call purpose? Um, I think there's a lot of learning that can happen. Um, I think that corporations can uh, improve their organizational culture if they adopt some of these things that we've been talking about. So no, don't be scared. Um, just learn more, come to more webinars like this. We'll, we'll probably put something together at ASBN to further that discussion. So thank you for the question. And I'm going to leave it to you, Elena, uh, if you want to answer that question, and then we'll say goodbye. Yeah, I think you've put it really well. I mean, I, I would say, you know, everyone can do better, indigenous or not, we all have room for improvement. And, and that's always going to be the case. So as soon as we all accept that, the better we're, the better off we are, and, and the more we can focus on it. I think this idea that we should already have, you know, that we should already have it figured out and be doing it right. And if we're not, then we're just wrong. And now we should like the, I think the question said, stay out of the way. I, I don't, I don't think that that's helping anyone. So, so, you know, I think a lot about this type of question, like how does corporate America, how do corporations really shift? And, and so many are, but um, what I say to people is that indigenous people have an indigenous ways of life, have a solution to all of the world's problems and, and corporations are the machine to creating those solutions. And so, um, Gosh, I just, I love the intersection of that. And that's where I, I'll just leave it. I think if you, if you're a part of a corporation or if you're, or if you're running any type of business or enterprise, um, you know, look to indigenous communities or indigenous people to help you solve problems and don't shy away from that for fear of doing it wrong yourself. We're all figuring it out. And to your point, you know, um, native corporations here in Alaska are, are all working right now to shifting from what they've been doing, I think over the past 30, 50 years, to approaching commerce in, in a better way. And so um, there's some good examples of that. I think Sealaska is leading, leading the way in, in, a lot of those, in, in a lot of those conversations and rooms and they're looking at how they're, they can change their, um, their operations and activities to be more values aligned. Um, but you know, these are all conversations that every corporation is having. And I think, and I think we all need to push it and yeah, be the leader in the room, bring up the topic and just don't be afraid. I think. The, the fear of not knowing the answer or getting it wrong is what's holding so many people back and, um, and we just need to get over it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. Um, the, I guess the other thing that goes to be said is that the native way of doing things, uh, we have our own success metrics. Uh, they might be a little bit different than the traditional metrics, yeah. but when my native corporation um, made a commitment to make sure that we always have elders on our board, that we always include traditional values. Guess what? We, came one, we became one of the top five corporations in the entire state of Alaska. We were wildly successful because we did it the native way. So yeah. I just wanted to end on that note yeah. and say thank you so much for joining me. A big thank you to Dune who's out there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we will we'll, we'll probably see you at ASBN. And I th thank you yeah. all for joining and staying with us this long. And have a great day.
And thank you to Alexis for moderating and bringing this wonderful panel to us here at ASVN. I put a link in the chat to where the recording of this session will be. So just be sure to bookmark that. You'll also see our future upcoming events there as well. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you, Dune, wherever you are. Good to see you all. Thank you for attending. Bye, everyone. <laughs>